So if I go and find my C engage stuff, I just pick any of these at random to take me there. this and go to 5.1 anyways. So listen dictionaries, I need to add, since we're getting close to the end of it, the quiz. But in the meantime, programming exercise 5.1, what is he asking me to do? A group of statisticians or blah blah blah. Define these functions. Media Median and mode also include a function named mean. Mean just calculates the average. Median calculates the specific value that's halfway through the list. Right, so if you have three items, it'll return the middle one. If you have five items, it'll still return the middle one, right? You just have to calculate the length divided by two. That will get you the median. And the mode, the mode's the one that's tricky unless you just use the statistics library, in which case you could do it in a single line of code, which is what I'm going to do. So they've already got a lot of this all defined. Oh, excuse me. I've already got a bunch of it all defined. Let me re uh, move all of this stuff. We should do it together. We should just do this in our notes. That's what we're going to do. Let's get rid of this and let's do it in idle if you so choose. So we're on lecture Q as far as I remember. Yes, sir. So we're going to write several methods, excuse me, functions. We're going to write one called median. For now, I'm just going to make a return zero, right? Later on, I'm going to make it do something useful. But it accepts a list as its argument. So its parameter variable is named L. And I'm going to write another one called mode. Same business. Return zero. And it's OK if you don't really. Why am I putting semicolons? This wouldn't break it in this language, but it's certainly not necessary. And in places, it would. And then one called mean, which just means average. I don't know why we have to have two different words for it. Maybe if you're a statistics or math major, you could tell me. If you don't really understand what the median or the mode is, that's fine. I'm not going to ask you to write this on your own. So just for grins, let's do it the right way with a main method. Kind of rhyme with mean and mode and median. So define main, parentheses, in parentheses, colon. And let's just print something right now. Lecture Q. We'll go and do some, add some good stuff there. And now we need our if statement, our if def statement. I'm only mentioning this because I had a question about it over the weekend. So if underscore underscore name underscore underscore. Make sure you put that space there. That's about the most common thing that people get wrong. Equals equals besides only putting single underscores there, quote, underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore. Now, the thing that I saw wrong this weekend is, and no shame in it, if I named my file lecture Q, they put lecture Q there. And it's actually possible for this name variable to be set to something other than main, which is the entire purpose of it. But for this purpose, we just want to check to see if it's set to main so that we can tell it was run within this same window. The only point of this code is to make sure that it doesn't auto-trigger as soon as this code was imported into something else. So if we import lecture Q, which I have not named yet, but I'm going to save as lecture Q. If we imported it without hiding our reference to the main function, inside this if statement, it would run it as soon as it was imported. 
All right, I have enough now that I should be able to write it without syntax errors. All right, that's all it does, but that's okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to find a list of numbers that we're then going to pass to these variables, excuse me, these functions, and get the results. So L equals, let's just put a list of numbers in. So inside the square braces, type whatever your favorite numbers are. I'm just putting one number in multiple times to make sure that the mode function works. I want mode to tell me that 12 is the one that occurs the most often. So I put 12 in there more than anything else. And then how about M1 is equal to median, parentheses L, in parentheses. And then just do the same thing for M2 and M3. M2 equals median parentheses L in parentheses. M3 equals median, parentheses L in parentheses. Then we could print them out, right? Print parentheses M1 comma M2 comma M3. Now, yeah, sure, we ought to print out better, you know, get better output than that. I wouldn't give you 100% if this is all that you did on an assignment, right? You should actually print, you know, median equals and mode so equals and mean mode and mean on the M1, M2, and M3 equal statements? Yeah, why did I repeat that? That was pretty dumb. Yeah, thank you. Mode and mean. There we go. Thank you. So now when I run it, yeah, it's printing 0, 0, 0. No surprise because that's what these three methods are doing. Mean is real average. It is real easy. There's a thing we should check for, which is to make sure it's not an empty list. Because if you divide by zero, it's a problem. It would generate an exception. How would you make an empty list? If you just did this and don't. If I did that and then I calculated the mean by adding them up with a the sum function and dividing them by the length of the list, that would generate an error. So what you could do is you could do a check if the length of the list is equal to zero, then it's a problem and you just return a zero or whatever. Because what is the average of nothing, all right? It's an indeterminate value, but we could handle that error case. So for mean, if len parentheses l in parentheses colon, whoops, no colon there, equals equals zero colon, return zero. Now you see that return zero there? It needs to be returned something else a, a little bit better. How about we return the length of it, excuse me, the sum divided by the length. We could calculate it and then return it. That's my preferred way. So on the line above that return, I'm going to do r is equal to sum, parentheses l, in parentheses, divided by len, parentheses l, in parentheses. And on the next line, it's going to be return r. Now I'm not going to really double, I'm, I'm not going to calculate the average by hand to make sure that works. I'm just going to trust that if it prints any non-zero output at all that it worked. And it did. If you feel like, you know, putting in more carefully chosen numbers and checking to make sure that the average works, but I, I trust this, right? That's pretty straightforward code. Now I'm going to double check to make sure that it doesn't crash if I pass it an empty list. You don't need to do this because I'm going to immediately undo it as soon as I run it. But now when I run it, it should show all zeros again because that's the error condition. We could even print something there, right? We could add a print statement that said empty warning, empty list. So above my return zero, I'm going to do print, parentheses, quote, mean function it's so mean. Mean function warning dash dash empty list in quote in parentheses. Right. And I'm going to test that out by cutting this stuff again. I'm going to undo that again as soon as I make sure that that error handling code works. Yep. Good enough. All right. So this function is done. It's easy to calculate the average. Just the sum of the list divided by the length of the list.
The median is a little bit more complicated, but hardly any. You just have to calculate the middle position, which is the length of it divided by two. But you better use floor division to round it down because you can't have subscript 2.5. You can only have subscript 2 or subscript 3 or something like that. So for median, middle equals len parentheses L in parentheses floor division, two slashes divided by two. And on the next line, it's no longer going to be return zero. It's going to be return L subscript middle in subscript. Let's see if I can eyeball what the median is. How many pieces of data do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So my middle one should be the fifth one. One, two, three, four, five. When I run it, I should see the output being four, five, four. Or if you feel like taking it up as zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that would work just as well. All right. And so our median is that. Good deal. Now this is the one that I'm just going to import the statistics module and do it because it takes like a page of code to do it without it. Yes, sir? On the if statement, uh -huh. are those underscores single or double underscores? These are double. That's the one you're asking about, right? Yes, sir. All right, let me come look. So rather than go and look at the PowerPoint and see the 30 lines of code that will calculate the mode, it may be a little shorter than that. It use, involves using a dictionary. Let's just import the statistics module. Import statistics. And it'd be nicer looking. That import should be up at the top of the code. I should cut it and paste it and move it to the very top. And inside here, I'm going to define a return value. R is equal to statistics.mode, parentheses L in parentheses, and then I'm going to return R. So these are the two lines that I just added. And what does that do, statistics.mode? Returns the most common element. In this case, I have 12 more often than anything else, so it's 12. Okay, so it's, just it's just a statistics term so for the most common element. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's what we got. Good deal. All right, I'd much rather do that than write my own. And as a matter of fact, there's a median and a mean function too. I could use statistics.mean and statistics.median. I wonder what statistics.mean would do if passed in an empty list. I gotta find out. Don't necessarily type this, because I'm gonna undo it. Down here in main, I'm gonna make a second list that's just empty quotes. And like I said, don't type this. And then I'm going to say x equals statistics.mean and pass it an empty list and then print that out. Print x. Just to see if it crashes or what. Yep. Mean requires at least one data point. Instead, we just return zero. Let me get rid of that now. Yeah, if you don't have any repeating numbers in here, it's actually going to crash when it calls mode. I didn't notice that. So like if I change these 12s and these 13s to some, you know, to something else, I don't think I have any, re any repeats now. And it's actually going to crash. So if you're Okay, fine. There. All right. It's going to blow up when it calls mode on this because there is no most common. Right. They all have a frequency of one. And what would it return otherwise? So you remember how to fix something so that if there an error occurs, you can catch it. And you do that with try, accept, 
So here under mode L colon, I'm going to add a little bit of code. And I know that I always mess up people when I start modifying code that already exists. But here's what we're going to do. Try colon this stuff right here. And I just tab these things over. Right? That was my change to it. But if a problem happens, except colon, let's print an error. Mode function, all values are unique, end quote, in parentheses, and then just return. We're not going to even return anything. Maybe we should return zero or something, but it's going to print none now because M2 will equal the return value, but if you do not have a return value, it equals to the word none with a capital N mm -hmm. instead. But we'll only see this if there are no duplicate numbers in that list. Mode function, not all values are unique, so it returned none. We could make this just the same, right? Mean function, warning, empty list. Maybe it doesn't return zero. Maybe it returns nothing. And then down here, it would print out none for that value too. But and then you'd have to check that return value. But that, that's, I like it. I like it. So that if the list was empty, we'd get none out of there. It doesn't matter which way you do it though, whether you return zero for the average. If you like thinking that the average of, you know, no scores is zero. Kind of makes sense to me, even though statistically, statistically, mathematically, it's not proper. We all good, gang? Okay. So, this would be a good implementation for 5.1. And we made it a little bit more complicated. We don't even need that error handling for 5.1. So we could just take some of this code and copy and paste it into 5.1, and we would have it actually work. And I did try it out, and hopefully if you all did the same, we'd get the same thing. But... I don't trust my tap. So what's the takeaway? Do I care if you remember what mode means? Nah. Just know that if you need something and it sounds like a statistics problem, it's probably in the statistics module and you can Google it up, find out how to do it. Just remember that mean means average and you know how to calculate average. It's just the sum divided by the length. Yes, sir. For some reason, I'm just looking at the syntax. All right, let me come look. Yeah, yeah. So, very common error. Code's not going to run if you have that out. It looks like good code. But if wasn't lit up as orange, because it's not a keyword if it's got some underscores right next to it. All righty. This is saying that the median that I should have sorted the list before I calculated the median. That sounds right. Maybe I should have. Maybe my code would not have been accurate. If I was going to do that, I would add a sort statement. Inside my median function. Right there. But that actually changes the list. If I sort the list, then this guy's data is going to be sorted, and I may not want to be messing with his data like that. And so what I would do if I wanted to make this median code really correct is I would make a new variable to hold a copy of my list. This is called cloning the list. So I might do this. I'm modifying the, me the median function now, and I'm going to say L2 equals L. L2 equals L subscript colon subscript that makes a brand new copy of the list if I didn't do that if I just did this then I'd have two references to the same list just like you have two street signs pointing to the same street if you sort L then L2 would be sorted as well 
or you know I have two names Professor Thompson and Jeff and if you go and kick my knee then you've kicked you know the knee of both names so I'm gonna do this which says starting at position zero right because that's what it means if you don't put a number in front of the colon and going all the way to the end because that's what it means if you don't put anything after the colon take all that data and store it there and then now I just need to do that so these are the lines I just changed that line or inserted that line and I just changed that one whoops one more change right L2 here so all three of those lines changed you don't have to add these little comments the only reason I put them there in fact I'm gonna come in here and delete them I'm down here so the median needs to be sorted before you pick the median my mistake but you know what if I just used the task statistics dot median it would have been one line of code all right I trust it I'm sure it's right hope so what if we change that to something else oh I forgot to sort it no wonder it gave me the same results I never sorted it so before I go ahead and get the median or after l2.sort add that line okay so we've made several changes to this module right I just inserted that line right there all right 15 being the median so after it's been sorted 15 must be the middle spot all right I'm gonna delete these little comments now So what is a tuple? A tuple is like a list, but it's so-called immutable, meaning that the ch values cannot change. Why would you want that? Mm -hmm. But if we come down here to main, and we declare something like this, capital F for food, equals, and then some cur not curly braces, you define tuples with something else. You define them with question marks. And so our favorite foods are pie, end quote, comma, and then dessert, or not dessert, um, cake, end quote, in parentheses. I could print out that element, print parentheses F subscript zero in subscript. It should print out pie. But if I try to change it, F subscript zero equals, quote, Celery. celery. Celery with an A or an E. Yes, there we go. Well, celery is horrible, so that's going to be an error. No, I'm kidding. The reason it's going to be an error is this is a tuple, which is immutable. It's an immutable list. Seems like it should be pronounced tuple. And why do I say that? Because it's short for multiple multiple right this is double and if you added another value you'd have a triple and if you added another one you'd have quadruple well what do all those have in common the word ple so they just called it tuple to, to mean all of them whether you have two or three or four or five values so when I run this this should generate an error and as a matter of yeah it printed out pi because you can access the element by its subscript, but you can't change it. Error. Cannot set any element in a tuple. Now we've seen tuples before. We've been seeing them since very early in the class. If we do this, print parentheses quote, I like percent s and percent s end quote percent and then we put some parentheses here open parentheses close parentheses close parentheses and if we put some names here like Fred and Sue 
Right, you've seen this index before. This is actually a tuple. You could pass in a tuple there rather than passing this stuff in. Just copy that statement. Delete the Fred and Sue part and pass in our food list, F. So copy that, paste it, come and delete the parentheses and the stuff inside it, and print the F tuple instead. And now it's going to print I like Fred and Sue, and then it's going to like print I like pie and cake. All right, why would you bother using a tuple? Why use tuples? Over lists. Tuples are faster than lists. All right, sounds good. Which to use? Sometimes you don't have a choice. If you're printing out placeholders, you have to have a tuple. A big list reason that you'll see lists used more than tuples, with no strong reasons to do so, is for readability. Round braces are used for many things in Python, but square brackets are always used for lists. Good point. There's a strong culture of tuples being used for heterogeneous collections. Okay, they're losing me there. Let's, uh, let's just stop researching that. So here they've made something called veggies, and they use square braces, so that's a list. But then they converted it to a tuple. Sure. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We have a list of numbers. We can convert it to a tuple if we so chose. So over here in idle. I could say L2 equals tuple parentheses L in parentheses. And now when I print out L2, we're going to see it in the tuple format, which just means parentheses around it rather than square braces. So print parentheses L comma L2 in parentheses. We'll see it in both formats. There we go, right. We saw it in list format, then we saw it in tuple format. The big difference is that you cannot change the elements of a tuple once declared. Now that could be kind of a neat thing, I suppose. If you were going to write a function and you made it take a tuple, then you're guaranteeing to the other programmer who might use your function that the data is not going to change. You know, I could be a total jerk and make the mean function change the first element. Do not do this. But I could, right? I could say L sub, and like I said, don't do this, L subscript 0 in subscript equals, right? And then the people who are calling my code down here don't know that my function is changing that value. Now that's ridiculous, right? Now, that's intentionally stupid. But some programmer who's got this list might have thought that it was okay to change it, right? I could have sorted L here, but that would change the list when I called it. That's why I made a clone of L, called it L2. I'm going to add a comment here that this clones the L list, stores it in L2. Just so you avoid the problem of having two references to the same data. So defining simple functions. Defining our own functions allows us to organize our code. This section provides how to do it. Well, thankfully, we know how to do this. Define square, parentheses x, which returns the square of x. This is using a doc string. We've talked about doc strings once or twice. Let's add a doc string to one of our methods. So I'm going to go to my code in idle. I'm going to add a doc string to the median. So triple quote, one, two, three, calculates the median of list L. And then more triple quotes. Now what's the doc string for? When I run the code, I can then type, help.
help space median and it'll dim it'll display that information so if I come here and I do help parentheses median in parentheses it gives me some help calculates the median of Listel now that doc string could be as long as it needed to be right calculates the median of Listel where L is a list of numbers, right? Now when I run it, and I do help parentheses median, in parentheses, calculates the median of list L, where L is a list of numbers. So if I was a good strict professor, I would make you add a doc string to every function you wrote. Meh. If you want to, to be good, good programmer, feel free. If you feel like skipping it, like I do a lot, 99% of the time, feel free to do that as well. So I'm going to add a comment down here. A doc string creates a comment that can be viewed with the help keyword, help function. So our functions, you define with the DEF keyword, you give it a name, you give it parentheses. Inside the parentheses, you might have a list of parameter variables. You might not. Main doesn't have any parameter variables because we're not passing anything. If we decided that we wanted to pass something into main, I don't know what, like the word wow, I'm going to undo this so don't type it, right? Then I'd have to declare a variable up here to accept that data. And since this is a string, I'd make it a string variable. I guess calling it s doesn't mean that it's a string variable, but when it is called, s is definitely going to be a string. All right, I'm going to undo those two changes. So parameters and name, it's how you invoke it. We call median parentheses and we pass in our data. Our data is called the argument. This is an argument. This is an argument. This is an argument. This has three arguments. This has two arguments, but one of them is a tuple. This also has two arguments, but one of them is a tuple. Main doesn't have any arguments. So that means that main is defined without any parameter variables and vice versa. So you need to put a return statement at any point in the function where the function should explicitly return a value. Main doesn't need to return a value. If main did need to return a value, I'd have to stick a return statement here. <coughs> Again, don't do this, but if I did that, x is equal to main, then I better put some kind of return statement here to fill in what the value of x should be. But x doesn't need to return anything. I mean, main doesn't need to return anything, so I'm going to get rid of those things. You can have more than one return statement inside a function. Here we have two. We try the statistics and if it works we return R otherwise we return nothing. Same business here. If we have an error condition because the length of the list is zero we return none else we return R. If it felt like putting the word none there with a capital N we could do that but it happens automatically. If you have the word return with nothing after it then that special keyword gets returned. So I just undid that. If you're going to look at your code and look at mine again and you wonder where that word went, that's where it went. I deleted it. So if you have the function with no return statement, then the special value none is automatically returned. So down here in my code, if I do this, x equals main, and then I print x, don't bother doing this, it's going to print out the word none. Right? x is equal to none because it didn't return anything. Now that's different from other programming languages like Java or C or C++ where if it's supposed to return something it has to return something. And if it's supposed to return nothing it can't return anything else. Alright, I'm going to get rid of those two things. Yes sir? Did you turn back on the reporting by chance? Oh, I hope so. <sighs> yes, thank you for asking. 
I love lecturing for 30 minutes and realizing I didn't turn the recording back on. The students who watch the videos love it even more. So a Boolean function tests its argument for the presence or absence of some quality, like is even, or is odd, or is empty. We can make a function that tests the length of a list, and if the list is zero, it returns true. I think I'll do that. So above mean, actually it could go anywhere. Nah, I, that's not true, but it could go anywhere above this if statement. Since I have everything defined inside functions, the order no longer matters. Otherwise, the order matters an awful lot, and a function has to be defined before you call it. So why not way up here at the top? Define is underscore even, parentheses, int i. No, wait, wait, no, no keyword int. This isn't Java. Parentheses i colon, and we're just going to say r equals i modulus 2. And if i equals equals 0, colon, return true. Otherwise, we're going to return false. Else, colon, return false. Now, we could have written that in one statement. And so we'll write another function called is odd that just shows how to do it in one statement, just so that you get the idea that if you feel like it, you can make things a little bit more terse. This is a little bit amateurish, but it's also very easy to read, right? We understand what it's doing. But if we did this, return i, or parentheses, i modulus 2, in parentheses, equals equals or greater than 0. Wait, what am I doing? That doesn't go there. Define is underscore odd parentheses i in parentheses colon and then return that. So you see one line of code can be equivalent to four or five lines of code. What is this doing? It's dividing i by two and if it returned a remainder then it's not even so it returned you know a true indicating that it was odd. Either syntax is fine. Want to write it like that? That's cool. Want to write it like that? So much the better. If this doesn't make a lot of sense to you, great. Just remember this one. How about writing one that checks to see if the list is empty? DEF space is underscore empty. Parentheses L in parentheses colon. return space parentheses l or excuse me l e n parentheses l in parentheses colon equals equals zero in parentheses and i could get rid of this closed parentheses and this opening parentheses if you thought it made it easier to read don't got to have those i kind of like it I kind of like the parentheses myself, right? So I'm going to leave them there. So if I wanted to call those functions, you know, I just do stuff like def main two parentheses in parentheses colon, you know, if is underscore even parentheses 10 in parentheses colon print 10 is even in quotes something like that right we're not going to even see this stuff because we're not calling main to anywhere if is underscore odd parentheses 11 in parentheses colon print 11 is odd. I don't know why I'm mixing numbers in English words. And now let's make a list. L equals curly braces, or it could be a tuple even. Doesn't matter. Now I'm going to go with lists, unless I think a tuple is a good idea. 
So 1 comma 2 comma 3, if is underscore empty, don't need the parentheses, sorry, if is underscore empty parentheses L colon print in parentheses colon print quote list is empty in quote in parentheses else colon print parentheses quote list is not empty. Now we're not we're not going to even see anything unless we go and modify our code to actually call main too because right now no function, no code is invoking the main2 function. Nothing is calling main2, so we'll never see any of this 10 even odd empty stuff. I'll prove that and I'll run it. Find out that that's the case. Right, it's not. So go down to your if statement and underneath it after you call main, put another line that calls main2. So just go down to the bottom and do this even if you're not done typing that other stuff if you're following along because this is just one line of code. Scroll down to that if statement underneath it, do main2 parentheses in parentheses. If you feel like it, you could even comment out main, but I don't see why because we're not asking for input. That's usually when I get tempted to do that. And now I'm going to go back up and show main2 again. There it is. Let's run it. All right. 11 is in fact odd. But I did not see 10 is even. This function did not work. Oh, what did I do wrong here? Somebody look at this code and tell me what kind of moronic mistake I made. The error is specifically in this line. Supposed to be R? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. No, double equals is necessary. One equal would not work there. But here I calculate a value. That ought to be the one I check, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. All right, now when I run it, it'll say 12 is even. Right? Oh, there it is. Or 10 is even. Good. Good, good, good. So, gang, if you weren't fo following along, I had to change that line. I had to change I to R. So you can provide default values, just meaning that if the value gets specified, great, it gets used. But if there is no argument, then it doesn't. So like something like this, DEF, my typical standby, hello, parentheses, name, in parentheses, colon, print, parentheses, hi, comma, end quote, what? Yeah, high end quote common name in parentheses, but I'm going to give a default value. If they don't specify a name, we're going to set it equal to friend, right? Hi, friend. It's awfully familiar of them. Okay. And then down in main, I'm going to call hello twice. I'm going to call it with no argument, and I'm going to call it again providing an argument. Susan. When did the name Karen become a joke? Right. You always hear that. Yeah. All right. Or no, it's Becky. Becky. Okay, they're both. Anyways, I feel sad whenever I see all those memes where somebody's making fun of the word Karen or Becky. All righty. And so it printed, hi, friend, the first time. It printed, hi, Susan, the second time. The first time we invoked it, we didn't pass in any arguments, so it got filled in with that value. The second time we called it, we did give an argument. So it didn't use that value. It didn't use the word friend. It used the word Susan. We see that in, inside the print statement. Right, because we've seen using the word comma end equals inside our print statement. Well, that means that there's a default parameter that's set to end equals end quote, you know, quote backslash in end quote. So main serves as the entry point for a script. Usually you don't give it a parameter variable and you don't make a return of value. And the script can be run from idle, imported into the shell, or run from a terminal. So if I did not have this code down here, 
I'm going to make a subtle change that disables it. Don't do this. Then when I open the shell, ooh, that's not right. Of all the things I could do to try to disable that, that was not right. Like I said, don't make that change. All right, if I do this, import, you know, and then give my file name, lecture P, I'm, I'm botching it, import lecture P. Well, that would explain why. And how do I have it spelled? Yeah. Lecture Q. And then I could call main. Right. So that's a point. As a matter of fact, I did not even need to add that. I did not even need to mess with it to get it to not run when I import it. So if I do, let me close it just to prove the point, get it going again. Python shell, import, lecture queue. Really? I'm in the wrong directory now. That's the problem. I'm not going to fix that. But if I ran this, okay, anyways. You see the, I hope you see the point of doing this. I got to fix it, sorry. If I'm in here, I'm going to put some print statement here. You don't need to add this. Auto runs, right? And so this is going to prove that if we run our code, we see that it do, does auto runs and then it runs the rest of our code. Because when we click the run button and we are in this file, then the name of our current instance is, in fact, main. We could even debug what the name variable equals by adding that to our print statement. And when we run it, we're going to see that that is what name is called when we run our code. But if we don't run our code, if we instead just import it, import lecture Q, then that name value equals something different. It equals lecture Q. So that's what the student who texted me and had the question over the weekend, I think they were trying to do. They were trying to make it so that it ran the code if you imported it rather than run it. Otherwise, I don't see why you did what you were trying to do. So the symptom they were seeing, the behavior they were seeing is that it was not running, right? Because if you change this to something else, anything else, like lecture Q, then when you run it, it's not going to run, right? Because the name is set to main, so it didn't run it. But if I import it, then it's going to run, which is bad behavior, right? You don't want code that just automatically starts running as soon as the import statement. You get real mad if you imported the statistics module and it started displaying a whole bunch of stuff that you weren't expecting. All right, let me undo those changes. I don't mind leaving that, I guess. The entry point for program execution, right here, except that needs to be tabbed over. Notice that their code never has the indentions correct. I keep saying to myself I need to take a couple of days and go through all the PowerPoints to fix them. I don't know what idiot thought that it was a good idea to ship the PowerPoints without the, with the tabs removed. So a dictionary. This will be the last thing we've talked about, but we've talked about them before. A dictionary organizes information by association not by its position. A list is organized by position, right? You have a first, second, third, fourth, fifth element. Not a dictionary. Now, we're not talking about human dictionaries where things actually do have an order, right? But the point of a dictionary is that you have keys and values. Something like this. We're going to create a dictionary, and then we're going to add some keys and values into it. Let's define one more of these. Define main three, parentheses, in parentheses, dictionary example. OK. 
capital D, because I'm not being clever at the moment, equals not square braces, not parentheses, but curly braces. That creates an empty dictionary. Or apparently you can do that as well. D-I-C-T, parentheses, in parentheses. Maybe some people think that's a little bit more understandable than using the curly braces. Or D equals curly braces. Either one works. I tend to do just that. All right, now we're going to create some associations. D, subscript quote one, end quote, and square brace equals the number one. D subscript quote one space point space five end quote end square equals 1.5 and then let's just do two and then stop right we don't need to overload the example D subscript quote two end quote equals two All right, now why did I do that? Print, parentheses, D subscript, quote, one, end quote, in parentheses. Now we better put a call to main three down here, or else it's not going to invoke that code. Is that function supposed to be tabbed over since it's inside main, just the main function, or? All of this stuff needs to be tabbed over because it's part of main three. Right, this the, word here is not tabbed over because uh, I wanted it to run automatically when it was imported. Is that the one you're asking about? Well, the main main three function does it does it need to be tabbed over since it's in the main function? It's not in the main function if it's yeah. under the main function. Oh, I but you're right. I could tab it over. But, but if I did that, it would only be able to be called from inside main because it was in main. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Okay, so when it prints out D subscript 1, it's going to print out the word none. Excuse me, it's going to print out the number 1. No, it's not. I've broken it somehow. Oh, what's wrong with that? It's not. It's not the word main. Don't know what I was thinking. Guess I wasn't. Oh, D is not defined. Now, what was wrong with this line of code? Lowercase D. Lowercase D. That needs to be an uppercase D. All right. And so it printed out one. And so we could do something silly like this. Total is equal to D subscript quote one end. That's yeah, supposed to be a quote. Quote one end quote in subscript plus D subscript quote 1.5 end quote in subscript and then we could print out the total maybe the English to Spanish dictionary was a better example but you could set this equal to anything doesn't have to be a number Although, you know, if you start changing your data types to something that are unexpected, then your program's not going to work anymore. But say I create, added something goofy to my dictionary, like D subscript quote 3, end quote, end colon, equals trace. And then if I print parentheses D subscript quote three end quote in parentheses is going to print or in subscript in parentheses when I run it it's going to print Try right there so it's an association this is known as the key this is the known as the value you typically do that if you want to look something up and see if it's in the dictionary or not like we could write some code that would ask the user for a word and we would look it up in the dictionary and if that word exists then we'd print it out. Let's add an if statement that does that and then we will start wandering down. So input, wait, 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 word equals input parentheses quote search the dictionary 
for what word, question mark, end quote, in parentheses. And then we're going to check, is that word in the dictionary? If word in D colon print parentheses quote found end quote comma D subscript word in subscript in parentheses else colon print parentheses quote word not found end quote in parentheses so if I run it, I better type in either 1, 1 1.5, 2, or 3. Otherwise, it's going to say not found. Search the dictionary for what word? OK, 3. Found that. Run it again. Search for 1.5. Found 1 1.5. I'm going to run something that's not in there. Search for 4. Word not found. Last thing we're going to do with this idea is we're going to create a frequency count. What's a frequency count? Like we're going to create a string and then we're going to find out what letter occurs most often in that string. And this will be a topic that we have to come back to in here because doing this for in five minutes is not going to be an adequate explanation. But let's search the string s equals my favorite food is, I don't know, tomatoes. That's stupid. <laughs> How about that? End quote, in parentheses. Or no, no parentheses, just end quote. Now I'm going to step through this list. I need an empty dictionary to start adding things into. What do I mean by that? Well, I already have a dictionary. And it's got a bunch of junk in it now. So I'm going to recreate that dictionary. And I need, should come up with a better name than D, but I'm just going to use D again. D is equal to a pair of curly braces. And then we're going to go through every letter in the string. For letter in S colon. If the letter is in the dictionary, we need to increment the counter. Right, so the first time it finds an A, it's not in the dictionary, and we're going to do something special. The second time it finds an A, it's in the dictionary, and we need to do something else that's special. So if letter in D, capital D, colon, we need to add one to its count. D subscript letter in subscript plus equals 1. Then back tab, else colon, D subscript letter equals 1. So the first time it finds a letter, it's going to set its counter to 1. Each time it finds that letter again, and it's in the dictionary, it's going to increment it. So the next time it'll be, the counter will be 2 and 3 and 4 and so on. And then when we're all done with that, let's just print out the dictionary. Rather than make all, the code all fancy or something like that, how to print it out. Let's just do that first. All right, search the word for what word, whatever, and check it out. When it said my fa favorite food is, I don't even remember what I put, tomato. There are two M's. There are three T's. There are four spaces. That's not uncommon. If you're analyzing English text, the character that's most likely going to be in it is spaces, right? And so on. So this is a frequency count. We could even print that out with a loop. For space key in D colon, for every key that's in that dictionary, print key comma quote occurs end quote comma D subscript key in subscript in parentheses. Now I may have botched this. That may be a syntax error. Nope. It worked. So M occurs twice. 
y occurs once, spaces occurs four times, and so on. Oh, look at that. O's occurs even more often than the spaces. How to generate this sorted is a different question. We're not going to answer that today. It'd be interesting, though, right? We might want to print this in order of most common to least common so that it would print O's and then spaces and then, you know, whatever, T's and so on. All right, that's far enough. I can't even think of any homework I want to add to this because our last homework assignment pretty much illustrates these concepts, except for creating a dictionary. And I want to lecture about dictionaries a little bit more before I give you homework on them. So no homework for this lecture. All right, let's mind? make a Dropbox and pardon me. Do you mind printing that? No, not at all. a lot of the notes that I was sure. I know I went too fast with it. Let me uh, make a Dropbox for it and, and then print it out. But I'll scroll up and down for the folks who are playing at home. There's the top of it. There's main two. Here's the mode and the mean function. There's the main. There's main three, except it's a little bit too long to fit all on one page. And there's the if name part. Okay. <laughs>